Loaded Dog by Henry Lawson. Read for LibriVox.org by James Lord. Dave Regan, Jim Bentley and Andy Page were sinking a shaft at Stony Creek in search of a rich gold quartz reef which was supposed to exist in the vicinity. There is always a rich reef supposed to exist in the vicinity. The only questions are whether it is 10 feet or hundreds beneath the surface and in which direction. They had struck some pretty solid rock, also water, which kept them bailing. They used the old-fashioned blasting powder and time fuse. They make a sausage or cartridge of blasting powder in a skin of strong calico or canvas. The mouse sewn and bound round the end of the fuse. They dip the cartridge in melted tallow to make it watertight. Get the drill hole as dry as possible. Drop in the cartridge with some dry dust and wad and ram with stiff clay and broken brick. Then they'd light the fuse and get out of the hole and wait. The result was usually an ugly pothole in the bottom of the shaft and half a barrel load of broken rock. There was plenty of fish in the creek, freshwater brim, cod, catfish and tailors. The party were fond of fish and Andy and Dave were fishing. Andy would fish for three hours at a stretch if encouraged by a nibble or a bite now and then, say once in 20 minutes. The butcher was always willing to give meat in exchange for fish when they caught more than they could eat, but now it was winter and the fish wouldn't bite. However, the creek was low, just a chain of muddy water holes, from the hole with a few buckets full in it to a sizable pool with an average depth of six or seven feet, and they could get fish by bailing out of the smaller holes or muddying up the water in the larger ones till the fish rose to the surface. There was the catfish with spikes growing out the sides of its head, and if you got pricked you'd know it, as Dave said. Andy took off his boots, tucked up his trousers, and went into a hole one day to stir up the mud with his feet, and he knew it. Dave scooped one out with his hand and got pricked, and he knew it too. His arm swelled, and the pain throbbed up into his shoulder, and down into his stomach too, he said, like a toothache he had once, and kept him awake for two nights. Only the toothache pain had a bird edge, Dave said. Dave got an idea. Why not blow the fish up in the big water hole with a cartridge, he said. I'll try it. He thought the thing out and Andy Page worked it out. Andy usually put Dave's theories into practice if they are practical or bore the blame for the failure and the chafing of his mates if they weren't. He made a cartridge about three times the size of those they used in the rock. Jim Bentley said it was big enough to blow the bottom out of the river. The inner skin was of stout calico. Andy stuck the end of a six foot piece of fuse well down in the powder and bound the mouth of the bag firmly to it with whipcord. The idea was to sink the cartridge in the water with the open end of the fuse attached to a float on the surface, ready for lighting. Andy dipped the cartridge in melted beeswax to make it watertight. We'll have to leave it some time before we light it, said Dave to give the fish time to get over their scare when we put it in and come nosing round again, so we'll want it well watertight. Round the cartridge, Andy, at Dave's suggestion, bound a strip of sail canvas that they used for making water bags to increase the force of the explosion, and round that he pasted layers of stiff brown paper on the plan of the sort of fireworks we call gun crackers. He let the paper dry in the sun then he sewed a covering of two thicknesses of canvas over it and bound the thing from end to end with stout fishing line. Dave's schemes were elaborate and he often worked his inventions out to nothing. The cartridge was rigid and solid enough now, a formidable bomb, but Andy and Dave wanted to be sure. Andy sewed on another layer of canvas, dipped the cartridge in melted tallow, twisted a length of fencing wire around it as an afterthought, dipped it in tallow again, and stood it carefully against the tent peg, where he'd know where to find it, and wound the fuse loosely around it. Then he went to the campfire to try some potatoes which were boiling in their jackets in a billy, and to see about frying some chops for dinner. Dave and Jim were at work in the claim that morning. They had a big black young retriever dog, or rather an overgrown pup, a big, foolish, four-footed mate who was always slobbering around them and lashing their legs with his heavy tail that swung around like a stock whip 
Most of his head was usually a red, idiotic, slobbering grin of appreciation at his own silliness. He seemed to take life, the world, his two-legged mates, and his own instinct as a huge joke. He'd retrieve anything. He carted back most of the camp rubbish that Andy threw away. They had a cat that died in hot weather, and Andy threw it a good distance away in the scrub. And early one morning, the dog found the cat, after it had been in dead a week or so, and carried it back to the camp, and laid it just inside the tent flaps, where it could best make its presence known when the mate should rise and begin to sniff suspiciously in the sickly smothering atmosphere of the summer sunrise. He used to retrieve them when they went swimming. He'd jump in after them, and take their hands in his mouth, and try to swim out with them, and scratch their naked bodies with his paws. They loved him for his good-heartedness and his foolishness, but when they wished to enjoy a swim, they had to tie him up in the camp. He watched Andy with great interest all the morning making the cartridge, and hindered him considerably, trying to help. But about noon he went off to the claim to see how Dave and Jim were getting on, and to come home to dinner with them. Andy saw them coming, and put a pan full of mutton chops on the fire. Andy was cooked today. Dave and Jim stood with their backs to the fire, as bushmen do in all weathers, waiting till dinner should be ready. The retriever went nosing around after something he seemed to have missed. Andy's brain still worked on the cartridge. His eye was caught by the glare of an empty kerosene tin lying in the bushes, and it struck him that it wouldn't be a bad idea to sink the cartridge, packed with clay, sand or stones, in the tin, to increase the force of the explosion. He may have been all out, from a scientific point of view, but the notion looked all right to him. Jim Bentley, by the way, wasn't interested in their damned silliness. Andy noticed an empty treacle tin, the sort with the little tin neck or spout soldered onto the top for the convenience of pouring out the treacle, and it struck him that it, this would have made the best kind of cartridge case. He would only have had to pour in the powder, stick the fuse in through the neck, and cork and seal it with beeswax. He was turning to suggest this to Dave, when Dave glanced over his shoulder to see how the chops were doing, and bolted. He explained afterwards that he thought he heard the pan spluttering extra, and looked to see if the chops were burning. Jim Bentley looked behind him, and bolted after Dave. Andy stood stock still, staring after them. Run, Andy! Run! They shouted back at him. Run! Look behind you, you fool! Andy turned slowly and looked. And there, close behind him, was the retriever with the cartridge in his mouth, wedged into his broadest and silliest grin. And that wasn't all. The dog had come round the fire to Andy, and the loose end of the fuse had trailed and waggled over the burning sticks into the blaze. Andy had slit and nicked the firing end of the fuse well, and now it was hissing and spitting properly. Andy's legs started with a jolt. His legs started before his brain did, and he made after Dave and Jim, and the dog followed Andy. Dave and Jim were good runners, Jim the best, for a short distance. Andy was slow and heavy, but he had the strength and the wind and could last. The dog leapt and capered round him, delighted as a dog could be to find his mates, as he thought, on for a frolic. Dave and Jim kept shouting back, Don't follow us! Don't follow us, you coloured fool! But Andy kept on, no matter how they dodged. They could never explain, any more than the dog, why they followed each other. But so they ran, Dave keeping in Jim's track in all its turnings, Andy after Dave, and the dog circling around Andy, the live fuse swishing in all directions and hissing and spluttering and stinking. Jim yelling to Dave not to follow him, Dave shouting to Andy to go in another direction and to spread out, and Andy roaring at the dog to go home. Then Andy's brain began to work, stimulated by the crisis. He tried to get a running kick at the dog, but the dog dodged. He snatched up sticks and stones and threw them at the dog, and ran on again. The retriever saw that he'd made a mistake about Andy, and left him, and bounded after Dave. Dave, who had the presence of mind to think that the fuse's time wasn't up yet, made a dive and a grab for the dog, caught him by the tail, and as he swung around, snatched the cartridge out of his mouth and flung it as far as he could. The dog immediately bounded after it and retrieved it. Dave roared and cursed at the dog, who, seeing that Dave was offended, left him and went after Jim, who was well ahead. 
Jim swung to a sapling and went up it like a native bear. It was a young sapling, and Jim couldn't safely get more than ten or twelve feet from the ground. The dog laid the cartridge, as carefully as it were a kitten, at the foot of the sapling, and capered and leaped and whooped joyously round under Jim. The big pup reckoned that this was part of the lark. He was all right now. It was Jim who was out for a spree. The fuse sounded as if it was going a mile a minute. Jim tried to climb higher, and the sapling bent and cracked. Jim fell on his feet and ran. The dog swooped on the cartridge and followed. It all took but a very few moments. Jim ran to a digger's hole, about ten feet deep, and dropped down into it, landing on soft mud, and was safe. The dog grinned sardonically down on him, over the edge, for a moment, as if he thought it would be a good lark to drop the cartridge down on Jim. "'Go away, Tommy!' said Jim feebly. "'Go away!' The dog bounded off after Dave, who was the only one in sight now. Andy had dropped behind a log, where he lay flat on his face, having suddenly remembered a picture of the Russo-Turkish war, with a circle of Turks laying flat on their faces, as if they were ashamed, round a newly arrived shell. There was a small hotel or shanty on the creek, on the May Road, not far from the claim. Dave was desperate. The time flew much faster in his stimulated imagination than it did in reality. So he made for the shanty. There were several casual bushmen on the veranda and in the bar. Dave rushed into the bar, banging the door behind him. My dog, he gasped in reply to the astonished stare of the publican. The blanky retriever. He's got a live cartridge in his mouth. The retriever, finding the front door shut against him, had bounded round and in by the back way and now stood smiling in the doorway leading from the passage, the cartridge still in his mouth and the fuse spluttering. They burst out of that bar. Tommy bounded first after one and then after the other, for, being a young dog, he tried to make friends with everybody. The bushmen ran round corners and some shut themselves in the stable. There was a new weatherboard and corrugated iron kitchen and wash house on piles in the backyard with some women washing clothes inside. Dave and the publican bundled in there and shut the door. The publican cursing Dave and calling him a crimson fool in hurried tones and wanting to know what the hell he came here for. The retriever went in under the kitchen, amongst the piles, but, luckily for those inside, there was a vicious yellow mongrel cattle dog skulking and nursing his nastiness under there. A sneaking, fighting, thieving canine, whom neighbours had tried for years to shoot or poison. Tommy saw his danger. He'd had experience from this dog, and started out and across the yard, still sticking to the cartridge. Halfway across the yard, the yellow dog caught him and nipped him. Tommy dropped the cartridge, gave one terrified yell, and took to the bush. The yellow dog followed him to the fence, and then ran back to see what he had dropped. Nearly a dozen other dogs came from round all the corners and under the buildings. Spidery, thievish, cold-blooded kangaroo dogs, mongrel sheep and cattle dogs, vicious black and yellow dogs, that slip after you in the dark, nip your heels, and vanish without explaining, and yapping, yelping small fry. They kept at a respectable distance round the nasty yellow dog, for it was dangerous to go near him when he thought he had found something which might be good for a dog to eat. He sniffed at the cartridge twice, and was just taking a third cautious sniff when... It was very good blasting powder, a new brand that David recently got up from Sydney, and the cartridge had been excellently well made. Andy was very patient and painstaking in all he did, and nearly as handy as the average sailor with needles, twine, canvas and rope. Bushmen say that the kitchen jumped off its piles and on again. When the smoke and dust cleared away, the remains of the nasty yellow dog were lying against the paling fence of the yard, looking as if he'd been kicked into a fire by a horse and afterwards rolled in the dust under a barrow and finally thrown against the fence from a distance. Several saddle horses, which had been hanging up round the veranda, were galloping wildly down the road in clouds of dust with broken bridle reins flying, and from a circle round the outskirts, from every point of the compass in the scrub came the yelping of dogs. Two of them went home to the place where they were born, 30 miles away, and reached it the same night and stayed there. It was not until towards evening that the rest came back cautiously to make inquiries. One was trying to walk on two legs, and most of them looked more or less singed, and a little singed stumpy-tailed dog, who had been in the habit of hopping the back half of him along on one leg, had reason to be glad that he saved up the other leg all those years, for he needed it now.
who was one old one-eyed cattle dog round that shanty for years afterwards, who couldn't stand the smell of a gun being cleaned. It was he who had taken an interest, only second to that of the yellow dog, in the cartridge. Bushman said that it was amusing to slip up on his blind side and stick a dirty ramrod under his nose. He wouldn't wait to bring his solitary eye round a bear. He'd take to the bush and stay out all night. For half an hour or so after the explosion, there were several bushmen round behind the stable who crouched, doubled up, against the wall, or rolled gently on the dust, trying to laugh without shrieking. There were two white women in hysterics at the house, and a half-caste rushing aimlessly round with a dipper of cold water. The publican was holding his wife tight and begging her between her squawks to hold up for my sake, Mary, or I'll land the life out of you. Dave decided to apologise later on, when things had settled down a bit, and went back to camp. And the dog that had done it all, Tommy, the great idiotic mongrel retriever, came slobbering round Dave and lashing his legs with his tail, and trotted home after him, smiling his broadest, longest and reddest smile of amiability, and apparently satisfied for one afternoon with the fun he'd had. Andy chained the dog up securely and cooked some more chops, while Dave went to help Jim out of the hole. And most of this is why, for years afterwards, lanky, easy going bushman, riding lazily past Dave's camp, would cry in a lazy drawl, and with just a hint of nasal twang. Hello, Dave! How's the fishing getting on, Dave? End of The Loaded Dog by Henry Lawson